Hello and welcome to another of my chemistry videos. The objective for this video is that after you watch it, you will be able to explain the significance of the Bohr model of the atom and how it relates to the identification of various elements. So we are going to talk about the Bohr model of an atom. And as you move along in history, this is probably the third model of the atom that, that we've come across. The, the first being uh, from J.J. Thompson. We had the plum pudding model where electrons were identified. The second model by Ernest Rutherford was a planetary model in which the nucleus was identified. And the Bohr model really only deals with the element hydrogen when, when Bohr came up with this anyway. And the reason he chose that is it was the simplest atom and so characteristics were more easily identified. Um, we had some issues back then with uh, Einstein had come up with the photoelectric effect and noticed that uh, metals struck with uh, photons of a particular frequency or higher and the metals would give off an electron and wave theory of light couldn't account for this. So along comes Niels Bohr with an idea of why this might be. And as we go through, we'll be explaining the photoelectric effect and why it, it gives off electrons, as, as well as uh, a few other things that, that'll be helpful in identifying various elements. OK, so we're going to tie together these two formulas, which we've learned about recently. Speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. And the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. All right, let's 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 get moving on. This picture you'll see quite often through this video is going to be used in explaining Bohr's model. And it should be pretty obvious to you what it is. In, in the center, we have the nucleus of the atom. And out here, we have orbits that electrons travel in. And of course, hydrogen only has one electron. OK, first let's talk about uh, a couple of definitions. Emission is when an atom, or more specifically an electron, gives off energy. And that's usually in the form of a photon. A little packet of energy is, is called a photon. Um, OK, and, and absorption is when an energy, an, an uh, electron takes in energy, or a photon strikes it, it absorbs that energy. OK, and as, I, as you can see in the picture, uh, electrons have distinct orbits with no in-betweens. And a good analogy to help you to visualize this is if you're using a ladder, there are rungs on a ladder, and there are only specific steps. I mean, you can step on the first rung of a ladder. You can step on the second rung of a ladder. But you can't step anywhere in between because there's really nothing there. You couldn't step on step one and a half, for example. It, it just doesn't exist. Orbits for electrons are just like this. When they absorb energy, uh, this is a little small here, but if this electron were to absorb energy, it would move further away from the nucleus. Maybe it would jump to the second orbital or the third orbital, depending on how much energy it absorbed. It can't go to level two and a half, because there's nothing there. There's no orbit there for it to travel in. Okay. By the same token, if there's an electron way out here and it loses energy, as, as they do eventually, it's going to drop back down toward the nucleus. Now it's going to have to drop into another orbital that already exists and, and fill that in. So electrons travel from one orbit to another by either absorbing or releasing energy. And quite often in textbooks and so forth, you'll see these orbits referred to as, uh, for example, the lowest energy level would be n equal to 1. If it absorbed a little more, it would be n equals 2, n equals 3. Moving away from the nucleus, the numbers just keep getting higher. OK. So let's talk about absorbing energy. We'll, we'll show you a little bit better what this looks like. Uh, we'll raise an electron to a higher energy level. We've got some energy that comes along. It strikes the electron, and then the electron's suddenly not there anymore because it moved to a higher energy level. It moves away from the nucleus. And that's kind of what it looks like when it's absorbing energy. 
moves away a little farther and it's now moving a little faster. Okay, emitting energy. Now, this will cause an electron to fall to a lower energy level, as I just said, toward the nucleus. Uh, when it gives off energy, it will emit a photon. I know that it emits a little packet of energy. The energy emitted by an electron moving to a lower orbit determines the frequency of the wavelength given off. And if you happen to be watching this, it might determine the color of light seen if, if the wavelength wavelengths in the visible spectrum. Of course, we know that the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible portion of it, is very small. So there are a lot of photons given off that we can't see with our eyes, but they're still giving off energy. Okay, emitting energy is going to look something like this. We have a photon in an orbit that's a little further away from the nucleus. It gives off some energy in the form of a photon, and then it's not there anymore because it has moved to a lower energy level. And it could go just one energy level, it could go two, it could drop down five energy levels. It all depends on how much energy it gives off. As you, you might guess, there, there are specific amounts of energy that it's going to give off. It can't give off a, a continuous range of energies. There, there are specific set amounts that it can absorb or emit. Okay. Um, when an electron is in its lowest energy state or closest to the nucleus, that's called ground state. If you think about the ground being very low, that might help you to remember that. Anything higher than that, if it's absorbed any other amount of energy, it could be in the second orbital, the third, the fifth, the, the seventh orbital, uh, when it has more energy, more potential energy than its ground state, it's said to be in an excited state. Uh, kind of like a bunch of teenagers that have just had monsters and rock stars and cups of coffee and whatnot. Excited state. So, what does this look like? How, how can we see this? If we were going to the lab and we were to excite a spectral tube that was filled with a particular energy or a particular element, a gas, um, you, you might see distinct bands or distinct colors given off, distinct frequencies. These frequencies correspond to distinct amount of energies that that particular element gives off. And each element has its own signature, its own specific frequencies that it's going to give off depending on um, the electron in an excited state falling, when it falls, it will give off these particular amounts of energy or these particular frequencies and only these. Each and every element, each and every gas is different in what it's going to give off. So an emission spectrum or line emission spectrum where only distinct bands of energy are emitted, each one is particular to the element that is giving it off. Now, if you were to look at the sun, rainbows, everybody has seen rainbows, it's more of a continuous spectrum because coming from the sun, we have a full range of electromagnetic radiation. So the portion that we can see with our eyes is a continuous spectrum. There's no spaces in between. It just flows from one frequency to the next, from one color to the next. So Bohr's model has helped us understand how we can see different characteristics or use those characteristics, this characteristic of, of energies absorbing and emitting energy to help us in ident identifying different elements. Okay, well, that's it for this video, Bohr's model. I hope that helps you to understand uh, line emission spectrums and the Bohr model just a little bit better and how it could be useful to us in chemistry. See you next time.